surprisingly, very few Koreans are aware of it, and even fewer Americans are aware of it. And that's quite a shame because Emily Brown was an American empress living in Korea. She was King Kojong's wife. We'll come back to that in just a moment. From Asia News Weekly, this is Asia Now, the podcast featuring stories and interviews from the Asia Pacific region. Hey everyone, Steve Miller here. Today, the story of how one American became the Empress of Korea. Or did she? That's today's conversation taking place in Asia, now. Throughout much of Korea's history, it was overshadowed by the larger powers in the region, most notably China and Japan. But after Tokyo defeated Beijing in the First Sino-Japanese War, Korea declared its independence and finally stood out on its own. The king, Gojong, declared a new era and the birth of the Daehan Empire. His wife, Queen Min, posthumously known as Empress Myeongsong, was unfortunately assassinated by Japanese agents in the late 1890s. It's an attack that still stirs up a bad taste in people's mouth today, but what if Kojong took another wife? Hi, my name is Robert Neff. Robert is a fascinating individual who spends his day looking and transcribing historical documents dating back more than a hundred years, recounting the tales of individuals, Westerners, who came to Korea at that time. I spend approximately five to six hours every day transcribing old newspapers and diaries and letters from Westerners who traveled to Korea during that period. It actually dates everything I write because I can't write contemporary anymore. I, uh, I use old vocabulary from 120 years ago. G- give me an example of that. What do you mean by vocabulary from 120 years ago? Well, instead of saying among, I use amongst and... I don't know. I, there's just my friends and family always tell me that my writing style seems far older than I am, which is quite considerable. Well, very interesting. Uh, before we get into the meat of our discussion today, I, I wanted to ask you this question. After you're gone, I mean, you're writing about things that are 100, 120 years ago. How would you like to be remembered? I don't know. I, I think I'd rather be remembered just through what I wrote. Uh, I try to write as much about the period as I can. But as for myself, I prefer to keep a low profile. You all, you already know that. I mean, <laughs> there's very little about me anywhere on the net. Very little about you, and you would be hard-pressed to try and find an image of you anywhere. That's true. There are a few images up there, but yes. Yeah. I do that because I like being able to sit down with people and nobody knows who I am. I've, I've sat with people before and they've told me what they thought about certain articles that were published that I had done and they didn't know that I had published them. And I hear the negative and the positive. You have written a lot of very interesting stories about Korea and its past. And recently, we had the opportunity to sit down at a function here in Seoul, and you told a very intriguing story about one of Korea's quote-unquote empresses. I was wondering if you could go into great detail and share that story with my listeners. Sure. It's one of my favorite stories, and it's surprisingly very few Koreans are aware of it, and even fewer Americans are aware of it. And that's really quite quite a shame because Emily Brown was an American empress living in Korea. She was King Kojong's wife. I'm sure many of you know, or some of you know, that in October 1896, I believe it was, October 8th or something like that, uh, Queen Min, King Kojong's first wife, was killed by assassins at the palace. And for several years, the king was rather lonely. And one day, he heard a missionary's daughter singing, and he was enthralled by her. 
and he actually courted her. He wooed her, and she kept avoiding him. And the more he pursued her, he eventually wore her down. But one of her conditions was she could only be his wife. She, she would not be part of his harem or one of his consorts. And he agreed to this. And then I think it's October 1903, they were married in an elaborate wedding in Seoul. Hundreds and hundreds of troops, soldiers out there. Uh, I think it was the Boston, Boston Herald uh, wrote a very, very large article about her. Uh, newspapers all over the world, especially in Europe and the United States, did the follow-ups on her. They investigated her past. It came out that she was from Wisconsin, the, the local Wisconsin newspaper from where she was from, did an in-depth investigation into her past. And it appears that her mother died when she was rather young and her father and her went off to Korea, one of the, the first missionaries in Korea. Great story. Um, Japanese were definitely against her. Uh, at one point, she's run out of the palace and on a, a donkey, and she eventually dies after Korea is annexed by Japan. It's a really great story because that is all it is. It's a story. It never happened. And it really, well, it's, it's like you said, it's a story that never happened, but it really boggles my mind that it was able to take off and be perpetuated around the world so quickly. Ah, yeah, but at this time, there just wasn't that much about Korea, and Korea was an exotic land. And at this time, the newspapers are filled with accounts already of Korea's nobility. You have Prince Wewa studying in the United States. And Prince Wewa, I like to call Prince Charming. He traveled, he, he had a an affinity for women. He loved women. Uh, while he studied in Japan, he got called back to Korea because of his carousing with Japanese um, working women. And when he was sent off to the United States to study, he ended up getting into trouble. I think it was his first month. He was in uh, New York. His father gave him a $4,000 a year allowance, and in one month, he spent $40,000 at Coney Island on buxom blondes and whiskey. Wow. Uh, Dad was a little bit upset, and he was grounded to the Korean legation in Washington, D.C. for a little while. Afterwards, he, he went back to school, and he proposed, supposedly, to four different American women. He even got into a fight, I think it was in Ohio, with an American farmer who thought he was Chinese and was kind of angry that this Chinese guy was coming to his community and taking all the good-looking women away. The farmer was subsequently jailed, and it created quite an incident between the United States and Korea because shortly after he was jailed, he walked out of the prison and returned like six months, uh, six weeks later with a couple of rabbits. He told his jailers that he felt a great urge to go rabbit hunting. So he brought the rabbits as to say he was sorry. If we take a look at this whole Emily Brown story, as, as you said, it was complete, a complete fabrication. Why was it created in the first place? I mean, who, who was behind it and, and what was their purpose? I have actually traced it down to three different groups, but perhaps the best answer was given by William Franklin Sands. He was an American advisor to the Korean government. He claimed that there was a journalist from a great New York daily who was in Korea waiting for the Russo-Japanese war to start, who had undertook to confirm his theory of the power of the press by creating an incident developed under the stimulus of none too good Canadian club whiskey. So a good bottle of whiskey and a great imagination started this whole story. 
Now, I wanted to get your opinion about this. Here we are 120 some years later, and we still have interesting stories coming out of, say, North Korea. It's uh, an exotic land for many to, to think about because we know so little about what's going on there. Uh, we take a story about Kim Jong-un and his dictatorship of all men must wear his hairstyle story a, a while back. Why do you think that we as a people, a global society, in 2015, with access to the internet, still are susceptible to these kinds of stories? I think it's because they're entertaining. Uh, we just want to be entertained. It's easier to look down upon them as being backward and, you know, remember the hole-in-ones? Almost a near-perfect game, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's exaggerations. Are, they're interesting. They're fun. Uh, we see lots of exaggerations and old Korean history as well as modern history. Uh, and I, I think that so much of it can't be verified that it's easy to manufacture whatever you want. Sticking with the turn of the century in the Korea, uh, in, in the Koreas rather, are there any other stories that you find particularly interesting that you'd like to share? One of my favorite stories is in 1888. It involves the German legation it was their uh, their consul. I hope the Germans will forgive me for mispronouncing his name. But Klein, Klein was a young German diplomat. And 1888 was an extremely trying time in Korea. There was a lot of unrest. And after the year had passed, it was Christmas time. And Klein was off to the Chongdok area, downtown Seoul, to have Christmas with some of the American missionaries. And he had his presents under his hands and stuff and under his arms. And he got to the missionary's house and he knocked on the door. The missionary's wife opened the door, cracked, looked out and saw who it was and told him his type wasn't wanted here and promptly slammed the door. Klein is a diplomat. You know, he's shocked that he was treated this way. And so he returned back to the German legation and his misfortunes continued because that night the German legation caught on fire and he stewed as to why he had been insulted in this manner. And so he tried to get to the bottom of it. And when it was his birthday, the following month, nobody came to his party. And so now he's really angry. It turns out that the Russian minister's wife the Russian representative to Korea, his wife didn't like Klein. And she had spread rumors that he was having orgies in the German legation. Oh, my gosh. And so the, the American missionary women got very, very upset with this and would have nothing to do with him. And it became quite an incident where the German government and the Russian government eventually had to settle it out in China where the, the main ministers were. Uh, the subsequent event that happened was the German club was formed in Seoul, and it was only open to non-missionaries. That way the men could go and drink and smoke and do whatever else men do in the privacy and away from the prying eyes of the, the female missionaries. Club eventually becomes Soul Club. Wow, those are some great stories. Uh, Robert, thank you so much for your time this week. I truly do appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot, Steve. Before I go, I'd love to hear from you. Taking a look at your home country, your home nation, your own backyard, are there any strange stories floating out there on the interwebs or in pop culture that people believe that simply aren't true. If there are, please share them. I'm dying to find out. And if you want to know more about historic Korea, especially the period around the turn of the 20th century, be sure to check out the articles and books by Robert Neff. Asia Now is a special feature of the Asian News Weekly Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, please share it with your friends. And if you haven't, subscribe. Subscribing is absolutely free. And when you do, the next episode is delivered automatically to you. You can subscribe on our website, asiannewsweekly.net, or in your favorite podcast application. 
You can also keep up with more news from the region by following Asian News Weekly on Facebook or Twitter. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please drop us a line. The email address is podcast at asiannewsweekly.net. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, remember to be true to yourself and to always be awesome.